About 10 years ago, I took on the task to teach global development to Swedish undergraduate students. That was after having spent about 20 years together with African institutions studying hunger in Africa. So I was sort of expected to know a little about the world. And I started in our medical university, Karolinska Institute, an undergraduate course called Global Health. But when you get that opportunity, you get a little nervous. I thought, these students coming to us actually have the highest grade you can get in Swedish college system. So I thought, maybe they know everything I'm going to teach them about. So I did a pre-test when they came. And one of the questions from which I learned a lot was this one. Which country has the highest child mortality of these five pairs? And I put them together so that in each pair of country, one has twice the child mortality of the other. And this means that um, it's much bigger the difference than the uncertainty of the data. I won't put you at a test here, but it's Turkey, which is highest there, Poland, Russia, Pakistan, and South Africa. And these were the results of the Swedish students. I did it, so I got a confidence interval, which was pretty narrow, and I got happy, of course. I had 1.8 right answer out of five possible. That means that there was a place for a professor of international health and for my course. <laughs> But one light, late night, when I was compiling the report, I really realized my discovery. I have shown that Swedish top students know statistically significantly less about the world than the chimpanzees. <laughs> because the chimpanzee would score half right. If I gave them two bananas with Sri Lanka and Turkey, they would be right, half of the cases. But the students are not there. The problem for me was not ignorance, it was preconceived ideas. I did also an unethical study of the professors of the Karolinska Institute <laughs> that hands out the Nobel Prize in medicine, and they are on par with the chimpanzee there. <laughs> So this is where I realized that there was really a need to communicate, because the data of what's happening in the world and the child health of every country is very well aware. So we did this software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. The, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China. And this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Huh? <laughs> and they said the world is still we and them. And we is Western world, and them is third world. And what do you mean with Western world? I said, well, that's long life in small family. And third world is short life in large family. So this is what I could display here. I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we start the world. And this is all UN statistic that has been available. Here we go. Can you see there? It's China. They're moving against better health. They're improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries, and they get larger families, but they, no, longer lives, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast, and in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh, it's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning, and they move up into that corner, and in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. <laughs> Let me make a comparison directly between United States of America and Vietnam. 1964. America had small families and long life. 
Vietnam had large families and short lives, and this is what happens. The data during the war indicate that even with all the death, there was an improvement of life expectancy. By the end of the year, the family planning started in Vietnam, and they went for smaller families, and the United States up there is getting for longer life, keeping family size, and in the 80s now, they give up communist planning, and they go for market economy, and it moves faster even than social life. And today, we have in Vietnam the same life expectancy and the same family size here in Vietnam, 19, 2003, as in United States, 1974, by the end of the war. I think we all, if we don't look in the data, we underestimate the tremendous change in Asia, which was in social change before we saw the economical change. So let's move over to another way here in which we could display the distribution in the world of the income. This is the world distribution of income of people. One dollar, ten dollar, or one hundred dollar per day. There's no gap between rich and poor any longer. This is a myth. There's a little hump here. Eh? But there are people all the way. And if we look where the income ends up, eh? The income, this is 100% of world's annual income, and the richest 20%, they take out of that about 74%, and the poorest 20%, they take about 2%. And this shows that the concept developing countries is extremely doubtful. We sort of think about aid, like these people here giving aid to these people here. But in the middle, we have most of the world population, eh? and they have now 24% of the income. We heard it in other forms. Eh? And who are, who are these, these? Where are the different countries? Eh? I can show you Africa. This is Africa. 10% of the world population, most in poverty. This is OECD, eh? the rich country, the country club of the UN. And they are over here on this side, and quite an overlap between Africa and OECD. And this is Latin America. It has everything on this earth, from the poorest to the richest in Latin America. And on top of that, we can put East Europe, we can put East Asia, and we could put South Asia. And how did it look like if we go back in time to about 1970? Then there was more of a hump. Huh? And we have most who lived in absolute poverty were Asians. The problem in the world was the poverty in Asia. And if I now let the world move forward, you will see that while population increase, there are hundreds of millions in Asia getting out of poverty, and some others get into poverty. And this is the pattern we have today, and the best projection from the World Bank is that this will happen. And we will not have a divided world, we will have most people in the middle. Of course it's a logarithmic scale here, but our concept of economy is growth with percent. We look upon it as a possibility of percental increase. If I change this and I take GDP per capita instead of family income, and I turn these uh, individual data into regional data of gross domestic product, and I take the regions down here, the size of the bubble is still the population, and you have the OECD there, and you have Sub-Saharan Africa there, and we take off the Arab states there, coming both from Africa and from Asia, and we put them separately, and we can expand this axis, and I can give it a new dimension here by adding uh, the social values there, child survival. Now I have money on that axis, and I have the possibility of children to survive there. In some countries, 99.7% of children survive to five years of age, others only 70. And here it seems that there is a gap between OECD, Latin America, East Europe, East Asia, Arab states, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. The linearity is very strong between child survival and money. But let me split Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 